You're watching Power Nation. Today on Detroit Muscle, our 70 Mustang takes another step closer to the finish line. We fab up a custom exhaust, the interior goes in, plus tech on rear diffs. Hey guys, welcome to Detroit Muscle. Today, we've got some pretty big plans. We're continuing on our EBC Brakes Supercharged 70 Mustang that we're gonna be giving away to one of you all. Now, you know with those resto mods, it's all about the conveniences, and we're gonna add some of those up there in the interior. But before we get into all that, it's time to set the tone on that Coyote. You guys may remember this cat. He came in and helped us out with that front suspension install on our Mustang. He's got a welding skill set that is above and beyond. Josh, man, I'm glad that you accepted the challenge. Absolutely. Now that Tommy's got the headers on the car, I can take it over by bringing the exhaust from the headers to the back of the car. Now we're gonna be TIG welding this exhaust, and it may be a mystery to some, but I'm here to demystify it in three different ways. First, we'll break down the machine setup and tungsten prep. Next, we'll talk about material and filler rod. Then we'll break down in detail the process of back purging. All right guys, before we can start the process, we gotta set up the machine. With the machine off, we're gonna go ahead and select DC negative. Now that we got DC negative, we can power on the machine. I'm gonna leave the AC balance at around 60% range. Our pulse feature will remain off and our post flow gas will remain at 15. But as far as our amperage, a good general rule of thumb is one thousandth per one amp. Now, since the material we're working with is around 60 thousandths, we're gonna start at 60 amps. But that may vary depending on how fast or slow I am during the welding process. Now that our machine's set, we can go ahead and turn on the gas. After we get the gas turned on, we gotta go ahead and set our flow rate at the torch, which I can blip the throttle of the torch, activating it, showing our gas flow at the torch, which is now 20. That's an ideal CFM for this application. Next, we gotta prep our tungsten. The material I'm gonna be burning up calls for a red color coated 1 16th size tungsten. Now, we gotta sharpen this tungsten since our material is so thin, I gotta sharpen the tungsten at a 15 degree angle because the sharper it is, the wider the weld bead will be, as well as I'm not gonna be putting too much penetration to our thin material, which will eliminate blowouts. Now that we sharpened our tungsten, those of you may be wondering, how far does the tungsten need to protrude out of the torch? Now a good general rule of thumb, the inside diameter of the torch also will be the same distance that the tungsten needs to stick out. Now guys, it's real important to know the material you're working with. Those of you at home may be thinking that this is mild steel. It's actually stainless. There are several different types of stainless, but also there are several different types of filler rod, even though they look the same. So it's real important to know the material you're working with so you can select the right filler rod to get the job done properly. All right guys, now that we're on part three of welding stainless steel, we're gonna demystify a process called back purging. Back purging is where you remove all the oxygen or air out of our tube and we flood it with a separate bottle here that is filled with argon. Argon displaces oxygen from the tube. Now, if we have oxygen inside of our tubes as we're welding, it does this. Here's two examples. Can't really tell which one is the bad one, but when we flip these over, here's where the problem lies. As you can see, big difference. This is all gray, oxidized, and contaminated. That's what we call sugaring. This is what we want to achieve. We want to see nice and shiny, uncontaminated weld but this is on a small level, but any level of sugaring is bad. So to eliminate that, here's what I'm going to do. I'm actually going to mask off one end of our tube here, and I'm gonna get it nice and sealed to where it's somewhat airtight. 
I'm also gonna poke a couple of holes in this end. That side set up. Then I'm gonna take our gas line here, stick her into this end, get this all nice and sealed. Now we're not trying to create a 100% airtight seal, but we wanna get some good positive pressure by the argon gas flowing in so that it removes all of that oxygen. Now we're pretty much ready to go. All I really gotta do, turn the bottle on, regulate our pressure to around 10 to seven uh, CFM, give it a couple of minutes to flood that oxygen out because like you saw before, where I poked the holes in this end, that oxygen is gonna come out here. Once it's flooded, we're good to go to make a successful weld. You know, as we get older, there's a lucky few get away with not having to wear a pair of these to see little things like the numbers on the sides of our sockets. As for the rest of us, we could all use something like these socket labels from SocketLabels.com. These have easy to read labels that stick right to the side of your sockets. These come in metric, which are in red, and the SAE ones are the black ones. They have a permanent adhesive, so they'll be stuck for good. Plus, these labels are oil resistant, so you won't have to worry about them breaking down over time. Now you can go out and grab yourself a pack for your sockets for only five bucks at SocketLabels.com. Coming up on Detroit Muscle, we finish our custom fabricated exhaust, then the interior. Hey guys, welcome back. Well, we've got our exhaust pipe made all the way back here to the muffler. Now we're in a bit of a discussion, if you will, how to get the tailpipe all the way to the back of the car. Now to accomplish that, we could go up and over the axle or under the axle. I got a test piece here to see if we can actually make it from the muffler and get our tubing above the axle. Now neither one of these are right or wrong. It's just kind of seeing in which way we can go. As you can see, we got our three inch tube up here just to give us an idea where we can route this big old thing. But with the suspension at full droop, we have a lot of room. But when it comes to being at ride height or at full compression, we're gonna run out of that room real quick. You also don't want to run the exhaust around anything that's temperature sensitive, like the fuel tank or the brake lines. I'm thinking from where we're at, you just need to run the exhaust below the rear axle. But the complicated thing of doing it this way is it has to look like something. It doesn't need to look like you're dragging something out under the car. No, definitely not. It looks like we actually have the ground clearance, but you know what? <laughs> By putting these pipes going out the back the way we're doing it, that's going to be some West Coast blast pipe style. Bruh. Just whoop. Building this custom exhaust, guys, isn't really a tube that's just all one tube. There's multiple pieces to the puzzle, as you can see, that I'm mocking up right here. Test fitting, making sure they're not getting in the way of everything, or they're gonna be heating up anything. So once everything is fit, I can do the final tack welds and do a full weld to complete our task. You know, with what we're doing here, there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle and a whole lot of obstacles that we have to work around. More so, we really want this thing to look like we know what we're doing because the way these pipes are gonna be exposed from the back side of the car, well, the looks is important to us. And I have to say, I think we're pretty close. Close, but no cigar, Tommy. I think we gotta get this exhaust lined up with the body line here. It's pretty flat. Now to make that fix, I'm gonna have to put a cut somewhere around right here, clock it a little bit, and we should be good to go. Where we're gonna make our cut is right here, and it can be made technically either here, anywhere to about here in this straight section of the pipe. If you were to get into the curve, when you rotate it, this and this will clock up or clock down. And all we're looking to do is clock this side of the pipe Now that we got our pipe marked, we're gonna go ahead and see if we can put a mark all the way around the pipe that I can follow with the bandsaw. There's a couple of different advanced tools that can make that mark, but we're gonna go ahead and use some simple masking tape. 
Now this is just like third grade, where the teacher told you to follow the lines. Now we have the line on the tube that we can line up with the masking tape so that I have a good visual straight line here that I can follow from front to back when I run the tube through the bandsaw. As you can see, it's simple, but it works. We gotta come down with that, man. I like it where it's at. Now that it's tacked, we can burn it up on the welding table, but before I can start welding, we'll have to purge all the oxygen out of the tube like we did earlier. Here's a TIG tip. Always make sure your arms are in a comfortable position and you can see clearly. It doesn't hurt to move the part where you want it to be comfortable. Well, we got our passenger side exhaust all fabbed up and I can't wait to hear that supercharged Coyote sing through that Flowmaster exhaust. You guys, don't run off. Coming up next, we give our giveaway Mustang a fresh new interior. Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. We're steadily checking off the things on our to-do list with our EBC Mustang that we're gonna be giving away to one of you all. The next task at hand is the interior. With our Mustang, we want this thing to have performance throughout, and that includes the upholstery. Now, we also want it to be comfortable to ride in, and there's a few things that you can do that'll go a long ways. Kind of like adding a tilt column, like that one that we picked up from Summit Racing. Now, we also have a couple of obstacles that we're gonna have to work through. We've got a big chrome shifter sticking through the hump from going from an automatic to a manual, and we've widened those rear wheel tubs, but we'll get to all that as we go along. For our interior renovation, we went to TMI for a full interior setup, including front and rear seats, console, and door panels and carpet. Now this is gonna elevate our resto mine quite considerably. First part of this install is starting with the foundation. Before we get too carried away with installing our carpet, we're gonna lay down some boom mat from DEI. This helps to reduce unwanted temperature and noise from the road, engine, and so on. To install it, it's super easy. You just peel it back, stick it on the surface. Now we've already laid it down in a couple of spots. We've got a couple more, and then we can glue in our interior. To trim these down to size, a basic utility knife does the trick. When applying the material, you want the surface to be clean, and I did all that before I started. Our floor is definitely not a flat surface, so at first, I massage it into place by hand and then follow it up with a roller to conform it into all the nooks and crannies. Now with our carpet setup, it's a bit different than the normal fuzzy stuff that just goes into the floor. With ours, it's far more of a custom fit. It's kind of tailored to the car. It comes in several pieces and it has to be bonded to the floor. We're gonna be using some Landau top glue. Once I get it all mixed up, we can pour it in the gun. And we're ready to move on. You wanna spray the adhesive on both the floor and the carpet. After it's dry to touch, you're good to go. We're gonna start with the tunnel and then move to the sides. Making sure to press each piece down and you wanna pay close attention to all the lines. That turned out pretty nice. Now I mentioned earlier those rear wheel tubs was gonna give us a bit of a fit. Well, this was my solution. This interior panel kind of interfered with it. So I notched this thing out as a relief cut. Now what's gonna be exposed on that wheel tub, I'm gonna cover with some material. It's that simple.
Now it did take a little whittling on this panel to get it to look that good, but it almost looks factory. Now the meat and potatoes of the interior has to be the front seats. And it's easy to see with comparison to that old stock unit, the benefits of the TMI interior. Not only have they knocked it out of the park when it comes to style and design, because it's brought our car from yesterday into modern times. If you'll notice that stock seat is rather flat. Our new one has the bolstered sides on it that not only help to keep you on your side of the vehicle whenever you're kind of carving out some corners, and the support of the foam helps to keep you comfortable on those long rides. Plus, it's a bolt-in swap. You guys know it's hard to find good help when we have to bring this old boy in. But there again, he does get the job done. Compared to what we started with, this interior has made quite the transformation. Now with its updated style and aggressive good looks, our new interior complements all of our hard work. Man, I can't wait to be sitting behind the wheel with some seat time out on the highway. Looks good, Tommy, but we're not finished just yet, and some of us are guilty of this. We can spend countless hours, if not years, on our project and forget weather stripping. Thankfully, the guys at Steel Rubber Products have all types of components to protect your interior from the outside elements, eliminate road noise, and most importantly, ensure your windows and doors stay sealed. And for you one-off custom guys, Steel Rubber Products offers components that are universal to your custom build. Up next, remember that scene from My Cousin Vinny about rear posies? Well, Tommy talks rear ends. Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. With your backside planted in the seat, well, I'm going to talk about rear ends. Now, we've all seen someone or even possibly been the person that was out showing off a little bit in our pride and joy. And when the smoke cleared, all that was produced was a single tire fire. The culprit is an open diff like this stock unit that we pulled from our Mustang. They've used this design for many years and they're very common. Open diffs are designed to let each wheel operate independently, which is fine with normal driving, but throw a little performance under the hood and all those efforts can be kind of a waste because all your forward push will go through the wheel with the least amount of grip, whether it be because of an uneven surface or a slippery road. You may be thinking that if you lock the axles together, this would solve the problem. In the application of drag racing, this is a pretty common practice. Guys install a spool or even go the budget route and weld the spider gears to the carrier to make everything solid. Doing it this way does make both wheels spin at the same rate, no matter what the grip surface or even if the wheel is touching the ground. But it does create another problem. Not all roads are straight. At some point, you're gonna have to turn the wheel. Basically, whenever you take a curve, one wheel kind of speeds up and the inside one slows down. With a locked unit, there's no moving parts to allow all that to happen. So, a solid setup is dangerous on the street. It causes excessive tire wear and it's hard on parts. A better solution for any application, whether you're on the pavement, in the dirt, out on the highway, or even at the track, Eaton's got you covered. Folks in the off-road world have relied on Eaton's E-Locker for conquering hills, rocks, mud, and everything in between for years. With the simple push of a button, you have a fully selectable locker with no air hoses or a compressor needed. If you're into circle track racing or have any interest in off-roading, then the legendary Detroit Locker could be right up your alley. This automatic mechanical locker is engineered for strength and durability that's maintenance-free. Then there's the original Eaton Positive Traction Differential. If you're into classic muscle, you've probably seen one of these, especially you GM guys. With carbon fiber clutch coatings and limited slip design, this makes for a popular choice in street and strip applications, as well as modern muscle. Now with our Mustang Resto Mod, we're not really holding anything back. 
We spent a lot of time enhancing the performance with modern technology. So an Eaton Detroit True Track differential just makes sense. We've used this setup in several of our projects, like our pro luxury build, Street Regal. This hopped up Buick had the goods. Performance from front to back, and we had to get all that power to the ground. There's a lot of technology that goes into a limited slip differential. The Eaton patented helical design limits the amount of wheel spin by transmitting an equal amount of torque to both wheels while moving straight. The quiet and smooth operation of Eaton's True Track can transfer three and a half times more torque to the high traction wheel than the conventional clutch driven limited slip. So if you're building muscle or upgrading for bigger performance, you got an entire family of overachievers. Whether you're on the pavement, playing in the dirt, at the track, or out on the highway, Eaton's got you covered. You know, today's been a pretty good day. We've checked off a few more of the boxes of building our Mustang that we're gonna be giving away to one of you guys. You can go to PowerNationTV.com and enter to win our EBC Mustang. You can also check out our project pages. There you'll find current build status, before and after pics, parts used on all of our projects. And ladies and gentlemen, I have to say, time to leave in the building. My rear end's tired.